Chris Bryant, hello. Hello. It is great to meet you. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Uh, you've had an eventful day so far. Yeah, it started very early because we've got to table things for the uh, debate this afternoon in manuscript, which you very rarely have to do because the government have been playing... I think the official term is silly buggers. <laughs> I, and that happens a lot, does it? Uh, government playing silly buggers is kind of par for the course, I would say, yes. I've got so much I want to ask you about government, about you, about your books, about the songs. Uh, tell me about this song list, because you're educating me with this My Pride playlist. A couple of songs that I didn't know, but I'm really glad I know, thanks to you. Well, funny enough, when I arrived in the building, I bumped into Peter Mandelson and told him I was doing this, and he said to me, oh, well, you'll have lots of Gloria Gaynor. And I said, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely not. I'm not sure that Gloria Gaynor, notwithstanding I Will Survive, I'm not sure she really is all that keen on the gays. Yeah. So not, I don't think Gloria Gaynor is a great person to have. So anyway, I've tried to do things which are a bit of, you know, chunks of my life, uh, things that I really, really love. And, um, and then there's a couple of cheeky ones. Maybe we should start with a big old fashioned trigger warning that you might cry during this first track that you've got on your list. Oh, almost this, certainly. This is, uh, My husband I mean, says that I cry, you know, at Yellow Pages adverts. I know they don't have <laughs> Yellow Pages adverts anymore, but... But if they did... <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Tell me about this. Uh, so when I was very young, this, this song from West Side Story was the gay anthem. It was, um, you know, uh, there's a place for us, or some, somewhere, there, there's a place for us, uh, as if... Um, uh, it's the slightly sort of tragic version of being gay, um, and because I'm 62 now, so when I was born, it was it was illegal to engage in any kind of homosexual activity, um, and when I was at university, the age of consent was 21. Yeah. So I'm quite often asked, "Have you ever broken the law?" And I say, "Oh yes, quite a few times, thank you very much." And but uh, um, and so I think it would, there was a very strong sense that homosexuality was immoral, it was disgusting, we were filthy, dirty queers, and all of that kind of stuff. And this was the song which said, there is a place for us and one day we will be able to achieve that. And one of the things I'm so delighted about in my life is that I remember when I told my mother I was gay, she was coming to stay with me for a while so she didn't have any choice about sort of sucking it up. But she said to me, I should always have known, you've got such a funny walk. Um, now that you're not allowed to look at me when I leave just to check whether I've got a funny walk. Um, but all those kind of prejudices, and she didn't mean to be nasty, but all those kind of prejudices were alive. And, and her big thing was, you'll be lonely when you're old. And yeah. what a delight that now we live in a world where I can be in a civil partnership and I know that I won't be lonely in my old age because I have a husband. We, we, we come from slightly different generations. But, but I, <laughs> what, what are you saying? No, 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 you, yeah, but, you you're know, pointing your finger <laughs> going, old man. You look wonderful for 62. Um, but it was the age of consent was 21 and I was 18. And, you know, I remember my mum chucked that back at me. She said, you are illegal. You know. Oh, and everybody made a common assumption that, uh, I mean, people referred to predatory homosexuals um, and they always assumed, uh, they conflated uh, paedophilia and homosexuality. Um, people went to prison. You could still get arrested for importuning, which meant meeting some uh, another man in a bar and going home with them if you hadn't met them beforehand. And sometimes the police used that right up until 2003 no um, they still used that if they couldn't get you for some other kind of offence. So, um, I, I, and of course, oh, and I, you know, and I remember all the the sort of terms of abuse like queers and shirtlifter and all that kind of stuff that were around at the school. Yeah, bullying was absolutely par for the course. Um, and and we inherit we we sort of imbibed that shame, I think, and felt it quite keenly i think when you when you chat about that and you look back on that does it is it traumatic for you no not now um because i feel you know that world has gone and, and i i mean in a tiny way i feel i've contributed to changing that world because you know we voted for things in parliament when when the labor government came in in 1997 we said we would introduce an equal age of consent at 16 um and you know we legislated for so many different things and uh, the right to adopt um gays in the military gays in the police you know you, you didn't used to have any homosexuals in the police no. um and so so lots of things have changed for the better I, I, I have a worry that we take these liberties for granted. 
because um, the right these rights we've got that you would they're not a given are they no and if you think back where was the safest place for gay men in the 20th century it was berlin in 1930 you know all the cabaret and all that kind of yeah. stuff and six years later hitler was arresting people and sending them off to concentration camps because of their sexuality and many people died and even after the war loads of people didn't want to have any commemoration of the homosexuals who were killed um in the concentration camps so um i, I you know we 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 i think we have to value the freedoms that we have and respect them when did you realize that you were different or did you know that you were gay from an early age it's terribly difficult to, i can't I, I can remember the first time i had consensual sex uh Anyway, there we are. Um, <laughs> it's just a moment past. I, I, I wasn't going to ask questions. I think we could. Um, but but I was. I still had girlfriends until I was twenty four. Mm. I mean, it wasn't. So, so the kind of final moment when I said, when in fact Donna said to me, <laughs> um, in bed, uh, Christopher, you know, I, and I was training to be a priest at the time in the Church of England, so I probably wasn't meant to be sleeping with anybody. But um, she said, look, honestly, Chris, you you know you're gay, aren't? She didn't mean it in a nasty way at all. But and and then it sort of like the penny finally dropped and 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 that was a sense of relief but that was when i was 24 wow okay that's it that's yeah everyone's got a different story haven't they yeah age. and it's not that i felt guilty about it or felt that it was kind of some great um immorality it's just that um i don't know i i kind of always assumed that i'd get married like everybody else and i'd have kids and two dogs and all of that kind of stuff because that's what we're told well, and certainly that's what we were told back then. And don't forget, I mean, one of the things that politicised me was Mrs Thatcher. Um, uh, people refer to Section 28, but they forget the speech that she made at Tory party conference in which she, she said that there are children in school who think that they have a right to think of themselves as homosexual. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if a prime minister were to say that? I mean, they, there are prime ministers around the world who say that today. Um, but isn't it amazing but, that was said in this country yeah. 40 years ago. And then they introduced legislation, which I don't think she believed in. Michael Howard was the minister who brought it forward, which banned um, uh, uh, teaching in schools about homosexuality, yeah. or uh, which it d described as a pretend family relationship. And, I mean, that that politicised a lot of people, I think, in, in the UK. And, um, and for some of us, it's not something you easily forget. So around about this time, this links really nicely into this uh, this song, Communal's Jimmy S S Somerville, because it was around this time, wasn't it? Just pre-Section 28. Tell me about this track. And tell me about the 80s. Uh, oh, Lord. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, the reason I've chosen this song is slightly different. I mean, Jimmy Somerville, obviously, magnificent singer, that that clarity of, it, of his voice, and, and he and, and Richard Coles, uh, the Communal's and Brodsky Beat, and all, all of that, it was, a, it was a really important moment of openly gay performers being able to um you know sing and and perform and, and and forge a massive career for themselves and obviously this is a cover version uh, but i think it's better than the original myself um but the reason i chose it is because the day that i stopped being a priest in the church of england which was easter sunday um i mo i had moved to london and all my furniture had been moved by the removal company and it was all stacked up in the in the living room and i thought oh god i'm going out for a drink so i went straight out it was like 11 o'clock at night i went to the la the london apprentice um in uh, the east end i walked in went st i put on a t-shirt you know took off my dog collar put on a t-shirt and a pair of jeans <laughs> fairly tight t-shirt probably uh, walked straight up to the bar ordered a pint <laughs> and then realized i hadn't brought my wallet and this man standing next to me said, it's all right, I'll pay. And it was Jimmy Somerville. No way. So I had to have this. What do you remember about that late part of the 80s? You know, we spoke earlier about the Margaret Thatcher speech. They, they were desperately dark times for the LGBTQ plus community, weren't they? Yes. And, well, it very much felt like it was the G community, if I'm honest, the gay men's community because of HIV and AIDS. Funnily enough, my first HIV test was an HLTV3 test. Um, that was the kind of what it was known as before. Was that the, what, the precursor? Was sort it? of, yes. I mean, I'm not sure that it was an accurate test of, of what ended, ended up being an HIV test. But so I, can I ask you, like, so when you must have been... I mean, I remember my first test and I was utterly terrified. But in the 80s, if you were positive, it was a death sentence, wasn't it? Oh, completely. And and I 
uh, when I was at theological college, there was a colleague colleague came uh, uh, from America, and he was studying with us for a year, and he suddenly died. Nobody was allowed to go to the funeral. It was completely hushed up, and we all thought, "What on earth has happened here?" And um, uh, and I mean, he died um, of uh, AIDS complications. And um, so, yeah, no, I, we were all very, very much aware of it. And I, in one sense, the fact that I was 24 by the time I worked out my sexuality, I think probably saved my life because I, I, I was by that stage. Everybody in the UK knew about HIV. Um, it was, you know, everybody knew what precautions to take if you could and all the rest of it. Um, and it was kind of drilled into me about safe sex from, from the very beginning mm -hmm. of my sort of gay life. It's hard to believe that we we kind of lost the whole bracket of people, it, seemingly, you know, really... The generation just a little bit older than me, all gone. They went, didn't Completely they? Completely gone. You can't imagine, yeah. so from the age of kind of 18 to 35, that that kind of you know the bulk of people who were going out on the scene just died and they died all of a sudden didn't they uh, yes and sometimes it would be you know you wouldn't even know that somebody was ill and two weeks later they were gone and uh and it was a very very painful time and also then there was the all the prejudice that came with it i mean utterly preposterous stuff about you know how people thinking that you could be infected um, and interestingly enough in relation to the infected blood stuff at the moment as well a lot of that prejudice and stigma um was attached to, to those who you know were, who were hemophiliac as well and had received um infected blood so it was it was pretty horrific and there was another bit as well which was the because in the old days, you know, if you ever went to a gay bar, you had to ring a, a doorbell, yes. and there'd be there'd be curtains over all the windows, and they you you they say sort of poke the door open, and they go, you know, this is a gay bar, or, or a or password, they'd, or something. yes, or you, or can you name two other gay bars, <laughs> yes. or something like that, or can you name two homosexuals, or <laughs> you weren't allowed to include Larry Grayson, um, <laughs> and um, and so that was really weird, um, and and in fact, very weirdly for me. Um, Virtually every time I went to a gay bar, when I was still a priest in the Church of England, they were playing It's a Sin by the Pet Shop Boys. Wow. Um, I thought it was a bit obvious to include that in the list today, but um, nonetheless, you did, know. Did you see the Russell T Davis? Yes, magnificent. And, and the great thing for me is the MP for the Ronda is that the, the Welsh lad in it is um, Callum Scott Howells, who's from the Ronda. Oh, and I remember seeing him perform in his school production of West Side Story um, in Triorki a few years ago, and I said, well, I think he'll go far. I mean, he was the star, wasn't he? Like, he, for me. he did the G-Officer Krupke. We're really upset. We never got the love that every child ought to get. We ain't no delinquents. We're misunderstood. Deep down inside us, there is good. Mm -hmm. and, and what a good thing that so many people saw that show. Maybe, yeah. maybe it was because it was shown during our pandemic. It was brilliant. The one thing I thought, this, this will seem an odd thing to say, but my memory of gay life in the 80s, 90s, and even noughties was that it was very white male. Yeah, uh, I, th I think a lot of other people felt quite excluded, um, and uh, and that and so it's a sin in a sense because it has black characters in it. Mm. Um, felt, I'm glad they did that because obviously you know there were many people, uh, black people who were gay as well. I mean, it, it, it's no discriminator of of race. Um, it's just that I felt that it was the our the gay community in particular in London was very white. Mm. Okay. Now, listen, I, I want to thank you for this Kirsty McColl song because I wasn't aware of it. And it's a gem. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. The, the, the thing is, once you've got it in your head, you can't get it back out again. <laughs> Honestly, this will be with you for hours. England now. too, Columbia nil. I know just how those Colombians feel. And it's, it's a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I may, maybe I'm the only homosexual man who has ever had an experience when it turns out that a man has lied to you. Um, but but uh, I think it perfectly sums up a kind of moment that you could you could just imagine happening and Kirsty uh, so sad you know killed far too young um, lots of great songs another option was um, in these shoes uh, which is which is another very funny song um, but I think this this epitomizes that kind of moment when um, you, 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 you have a snog and then you realize oh my god I nearly made a really bad mistake have there been many of those can we get personal <laughs> but then again too few to many 
mention it, <laughs> to quote somebody else. You you can go to hell, I'm going to Brazil. That was my <laughs> <laughs> he it. lied about his status, he <laughs> lied about his life, he forgot he had three children, he forgot he had a wife. Now it's England too, Colombia nil, I know just how those Colombians feel. You sound like you're very much in love, like, can, you, can I ask you a few questions, where did you meet? <laughs> we met in the yard. <laughs> did you? Which is a... A public house in Soho. Yeah, we, we were. I was out with LGBT Labour. In fact, I think where Streeting might have been with us. We were canvassing the gay bars of Soho to get people to vote for the Labour Party in the mayoral elections. Uh, and I went up to Jared and said, um, "Are you able to vote in London? Yes. You registered to vote? Yes. Will you be voting Labour? Yes." And moved on. And then the next day, he found my email address and sent me an email. I love that. And how long have you been together? So we got married on the 27th of March, or civilly partnered on the 27th of March in 2010. Uh, we were the first couple to do so physically in the Palace of Westminster in Parliament. Oh, wow. Uh, and <laughs> How did yes. that feel? Uh, it was very special. It was lovely. We did it in the dining room. Not, we're not allowed the chapel, um, right. but that was fine. The dining room was very beautiful. And Scylla Black came. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I bet, I bet you thought... She was a plus one. She was a plus one? Yes. Who's plus one? A friend of mine called Howells. But I bet, seriously, I bet that was, you know, one of those moments that you... I mean, lots of people that I know that got married, uh, it's been very emotional because they never thought that they would see that day or have that experience. Well, this takes us to um, my next song, actually, Moon River, because Jared and I walked into Moon River, oh, sung yes. by Blake. Um, and uh, because it's it's Jared's favourite film, you know the, the the original version as well, not all the souped up versions by Andy Williams and all sorts of. So other the people, original, but was the from... absolutely original on the on the film Breakfast at Tiffany. Yes, uh, when she's just sitting out on the on the on the sort of um, fire escape and she just plays at, at, uh, along to the guitar, and so it's that version. Um, and the thing is now, whenever we're anywhere, and I want to. Um, irritate Jared I, and, and and you can have music selected I'll get somebody to play it so how does it and I bet that goes down well how does this song make you feel when when it starts oh I cry yeah yes I mean it's a I mean it is a very tender sort of song isn't it and um and some of the lyrics are slightly curious and and the film is you know wacky um and uh a great character name, Holly Go Lightly. Yeah, yeah, it really has got such a, a f emotional feel to it. This doesn't it? Quick question about the marriage thing. You know, obviously it's brilliant. We've got great rights. What are we yet to? What are we yet to achieve as a community? What's on, what's still on the list? Well, I do worry about the place that we're at in the national debate about trans um, because some of the hostility does feel like the old hostility from the 70s and 80s when you know people who argued for gay rights were accused of being loony lefties and all the rest of it um do you think is that because people are scared i think it's in some cases it's because people want to weaponize this for party political purposes and in some cases it's because of a fundamentalist christian set of beliefs um or other religious beliefs maybe i don't know um you know, I, I, I fully get that there are some instances where, where you know, there's very legitimate concern, and I want to make sure that women have a right to women-only spaces as well. Um, but um, you know, Kemi Badnock has used the phrase an epidemic. Well, I can remember an ep epidemic. It was the ep AIDS epidemic. Yeah, it was infectious, contagious. It killed people. I don't think you should use that around this debate about trans. It's not helpful, is it? I think it's awful. Upsets me. It seems recently that it's become such a hot potato, like since the pandemic. Why is it blow why is this issue such a problem? Why is it blown up and why because it's such a short it, it's, it's it's a tiny percentage of people, isn't it? So why is everybody so crazy about it and the truth is it's all about um nuance and sensitivity i think that's all we need in the debate rather than people trying to bring sledgehammers into it uh and uh, th and that's why it's depressed me in the last couple of years um you know i want every child to be able to um, grow up able to be the person that they most fully are and um i think that that's difficult will we get there with the whole trans things can you see in 20 years that 
you know, that they will have the rights that we now have. Because we were struggling, as gay men, we were struggling in the late 80s and we felt very much inferior people. You know, we were not normal. Uh, 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 it seems that all of those words are now being used towards our trans friends. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because George Galloway um, is a hero to some people on the left... I have no idea why, but he is openly saying that he, you know, he doesn't think he thinks homosexuality is wrong, um, and uh, and there are plenty of people who would want us to put uh, want to put us right back in the closet, if not for that matter in prison. So I, I that's why I think pride is so important because it is about constantly <laughs> reasserting that um, uh, good as you. We've got a couple of like random questions yep. I'm going to throw at you. Um, What's your relationship with religion now? And did, was, the, you know, you were, you were a priest, weren't you? Yeah, priest in the Church of England. Not, so not Catholic, people often get that confused, but a priest in the Church of England. I was a curate in High Wycombe for a few years and then I was uh, a youth chaplain running um, stuff for um, young people in the Diocese of Peterborough, which covers most of Northamptonshire. Um, and then I kind of worked out, I'm sorry, the, I'm gay, the church doesn't really want the gays. I'm off. Was it how difficult was that at the time? I was 29, and I I could sit. I I, I met people who, I met gay clergy. There were lots of gay clergy, but they were completely closeted. They couldn't live with a partner, um, and and they felt miserable. That's because could be of it. so divisive, isn't it? Yeah, completely, and and completely counterproductive, um, and um, and it didn't really preach a gospel of love either. Um, now. I don't think I ever really believed in in a god in the sky who, if five thousand people prayed for it to rain and four thousand eight hundred prayed prayed for sun, it decided that there'd be rain. I've mm-hmm. never believed in that, um, and I always, but I always thought that Jesus's teaching was about the best you could conceive of, and especially because he didn't preach with his. They weren't like lectures. They were more like parables or stories, which you had to read against your own situation. So, so, and I still hold all of that. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't go to church very much. I kind of feel that the church doesn't really want us. So, why would we want it? This is a question that I ask every guest. I'm just interested in getting your answer. If somebody's listening right now, and they're listening to you, and they're thinking, "Wow." You know, he's really made some of his life and he is who he says he is. What would you say, you know, to somebody who's confused and thinking, I'm not sure if I can come out or how I could deal with my feelings and stuff? What what, what would be your advice? Uh, So there are lots of people for whom family life is not easy in this, um, in in these debates um, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, And that's very tough. But in the end, you will live with yourself longer than you will live with anybody else. So being true to yourself, which may not always be easy to decide quite what that looks like, that's the single most important thing that you have to do in your life. And that's the only source of happiness and joy. And how do you do it? Well, I think for most of the people I know, there have been kind of role models. I don't necessarily mean famous people. I just mean people in that, that they've known in their life who have been helpful and supportive. Yeah. Um, and um, being alert to that, I think, is really important. Um, I... I... You, you do have to find a degree of strength in yourself, inner strength. Um... And sometimes that is really, really tough. Um, and of course, sometimes there's real emotional and physical abuse in, in some people's lives, which, you know, I, I, as an MP, quite often I have people come through my door telling me stories and you go, oh my God. Really? Oh my God, I feel for you and I wish I could, um, re- you know, reach out and touch you in, not physically, I mean, reach out and touch you in a way that could really make a difference to your life. Yeah. Um, that you know, talking to people really helps. The one thing that doesn't work is just bottling it up. Yeah. It really doesn't work. It just it can it can fester. It can 
uh, make you deeply, deeply unhappy, and and then sometimes rage comes with that unhappiness as well. Yeah. So really finding people to talk to, um, either in your school setting, if you're a young person, you know, at school or in university or whatever, um, I think that's a really important part of managing to find that that kind of inner version of yourself and of course that doesn't mean that you just accept the first version that comes to you, into your mind and and so on because i think we life is always about learning more from the mistakes that you've made and um managing to sit or seeking to improve yourself lovely stuff well thank you so much for doing this we've got one we, more song i was going to ask you i was going as we go into the next song tell me about this song baccarat yes now i had toyed with going with a different baccarat song sorry i'm a lady sorry i'm a lady <laughs> i would rather be just a little shady uh but i went with yes sir i can boogie um there's you know you can't not dance to this uh and it's the it's all apart from anything else it's the it's i think they're putting on the kind of spanish accent a bit because <laughs> yes. they speak perfectly good english um but they are absolute spanish eurovision royalty baccarat um yes sir i can boogie Virgin Radio. 